uh, to watch again or to share with your colleagues. Uh, we will also send out a survey after the webinar um, to get your feedback on thoughts about uh, data um, webinars uh, through the group platform. So please be aware of that. Um, my name is Tammy Morris and I will be moderating this session um, and I'll be joined by a panel of experts who will be introduced um, in a little bit. For this webinar, we will stream a presentation given by uh, Dr. Sylvie Polquin um, around the Argo data management system. Uh, the description given pertains to all Argo data, be it from core Argo floats that look at temperature and salinity, um, and biogeochemical floats, which have upwards of, or up to six uh, sensors involved uh, thereon. Um, so we're joined by a panel of experts, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves now, and we'll start with Megan. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Megan Skanderbeg. I work at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California. Uh, I work on a couple different things for Argo. Uh, one is maintaining their website and helping with um, coordinating of the whole program. And then the other is I'm the Argo Man Data Management Team co-chair. So thank you, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Annie, would you like to go ahead? Hello, I'm Annie Wong. I'm a research scientist at the University of Washington. Um, I'm a physical oceanographer. Uh, what I do in Argo, I'm part of the Argo data management team and I coordinate the quality control and adjustment procedures for the physical parameters, pressure, temperature, and salinity. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Catherine? Hello, I'm Catherine Schmitt. I am an engineer and I am uh, working for CNRS in France and I am the co-chair of the VGC Argo Data Management. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Thierry? Yes, so hello, I'm Thierry Carval from uh, Ifremer in France. Uh, I am a data manager and uh, in charge of uh, the Argo Data Management for European Data Assembly Center. But another work is another task is uh, that I am in charge with my US colleague, Mai Frost uh, from uh, Monterey, uh, to manage the data from and distribute the data from the Argo Global Data Assembly Center. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to go ahead now and slice the uh, presentation from Sylvie. Uh, please, um, if you have any questions, Jot them down so long, otherwise, uh, put them in the chat and we'll start moderating. After the uh, presentation, which is about 14 to 15 minutes long, we will then do the QA session. So, thank you very much, Mark. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Sylvie Poulikin. I'm the co-chair of the Argo Data Management team since its creation in 2000. Uh, I will be presenting today the Argo Data Management system and how it has been improved to be able to handle Argo BGC Argo data. So since the start, the Argo data system has been designed in order to serve both the scientific research community that is interested in high quality data and the operational services that, are, that need to have real time data stream as well as deliver data stream for realizers. Since the beginning, the Argo data system has been made of a free and open data policy, which means that all the data are available without any registration as soon as they have been processed. So the two data stream are the three, in fact, three data stream are as following. A real-time data stream that provide access within 12 hours from acquisition to, to profile data that have been automatically assessed through a set of quality control tests and that are aiming at serving the operational applications that need to have rapid access to the data. The purpose of the automatic QC test is to detect obviously bad data, but it's true that potentially suspicious data can go through. In terms 
in delay mode, then the data goes with through a scientific assessment that is done within 12 months from acquisition that looked in at the complete time series analysis and corrections and that ends at detecting bad sensor behavior and be able to correct to propose a correction if possible but at least to to fly as uh, as bad the data that are obviously bad and then there is uh, another step that is uh, consist of basin scale consistency check that look at a batch of float in an area and check if they are consistent with each other and also consistent with other recent data that are available in the area. So the way the Argo data system is managed at international level, float, send the measurements to the deck where raw data are processed and then the DAX sends to two GDAX, one located in Coriolis in France and one located in the numerical center in the US. The purpose to have two GDAX is that allows that, that all the data are always available to, to everybody because none we it had then happened in the past 20 years that both the GDAX were down at the same time. Uh, another important element is the Argo Information Center that is managed by OceanOps that allows a registration of the float prior to deployment to in order to comply with the IOC Resolution 26. That um, manage also information, metadata information on the profiles themselves and ensure monitoring of the fleet when it's at sea. So how the, the Argo data system that has been developed for pressure, temperature, and salinity has been extended to manage PGC parameters, oxygen, chlorophyll, backscatter, nitrite, pH, and irradiates. The Argo vocabulary has been extended. The data format has been enhanced in order to manage the PGC variables. Real-time QC quality control uh, procedure has been developed for the six variables and also implemented in the 11 DAX. De the delay mode quality control procedure for the six variables are still under development but are progressing well. And the sharing of tools is made also on collaborative platform. The purpose is that wherever the data are processed, they are processed in a consistent manner so that they can be used easily by the, the different uh, from the GDEX. BGC data system requires the additional manpower and expertise in order to reach the ocean health and climate challenges that we are facing. And the delay mode data processing need to be funded and organized at the international level and this point is still under development. What is different between the BTC and, uh, and the core mission is that real-time data stream for BTC is even more challenging than the one developed for pressure and temperature and salinity. While very few pressure, temperature and salinity measurements need adjustment in real time at the early stage of their lifetime, nearly all BTC data needs to be adjusted in real time. An automated real-time adjustment for all BGC variables is still under development as we need to have enough BGC data at sea in order to build robust procedure to be implemented in 11 DAX. So be cautious with raw BGC data and focus on adjusted or delay mode data in your, in your application. The Argo data management system is managed uh, by an Argo data management team that is organized at international level that gather about 100 persons all over the world. And that is form of DAC representative and scientists. And also a specific BGC Argo data management team has been set up in order to complement in terms of expertise the, the, the expertise needed for BGC development. 
this data management team meet annually for a full week to discuss Argo data related issues as well as to agree on data format, data correction and methods, quality control procedures. Argo data follow an open and free data policy and in order to, to track the use of the Argo data, we use uh, this and it's important to acknowledge the use of Argo new publication. Through this monitoring of the publication, we are able to show the value of Argo for the scientific uh, research. Since uh, the start of Argo, nearly 4,700 papers have been uh, published since the late 90s for the, for the Argo in general. And if you look at the BGC Argo, even if we are still in the pilot phase of BGC Argo already, nearly 300 papers have been published and we see that we are in the same exponential curve of uh, increasing public publication based on BGC Argo as the ones we experienced for our Argo uh, in the past 10, 20 years. So going concretely, how do you, how the files are organized at the, at the GDAC and how can you access to the data? GDAC organized with three main folders. The DAC folder that sorts the data by Data Assembly Center. The GEO folder that sorts the data by Ocean Basin and the latest data folders that includes the most recent data, the data for the latest month. For each of these directory, you, you have index files that contain the metadata on each Argo data file and uh, that are contained in the data in geo folders as well as in the latest. And the gray list file contains the list of floats that are likely to have a sensor problem and that you should be using if you want to discard the floats that may have sensor problem in your application. Finally, there is another directory that is called OX that contains the data from experimental sensors that are sensors, sorry, that are not yet labeled as Argo sensors because they don't have enough uh, float at sea to, to be able to, to assess their quality. The official Argo data are available in GDAC in NetCDF file, complying with the, Net, with the CF convention. And, um, and you find so the, the, the real the, the, the files in four different uh, type of files, the trajectory in trash files, the, meta, the metadata in meta files, the profile in the profiles, and the tech technical information in a tech file. You have it for the in each directory with the full time series of the lifetime of the float and in the profile directory, profile by profile. If a delay mode quality control has been performed, then you have in the file the adjusted fields that are made available and also the file as a name of, you have a D in front of the file. Each parameter is associated with a QC flag, but be aware that all the data are kept in the files. So you need to use a QC flag in order to sort out the data that are good or bad. So in real time, the Q, if only automatic QC has been applied, you, you find this QC information on the, on the for example, for doxy, in doxy underscore QC. If an adjustment has been made in real time, for example, for doxy variables, an automatic, uh, automatically apply a gain correction has been done, then you find the, inform the QC information in doxy adjusted QC. And similarly, if a delay mode QC has been applied, you find it in doxy adjusted QC. What the QC flag tells you is that to, to be on the safe side, only use the data with QC flag equal to one and discard systematically all the data with QC flag equal to four. Then using, if you, you can use 
the other type of data, but this is cautious. All the information about the QC applied are available in the manual described here. So the philosophy for the BGC data is the same as for the core angle, except that we have two additional files that are made available. The B files that contain all the information required by the profile by the profiled variables as well as the biochemical information. And then the S prof synthetic profile that contain all the BGC variables along with the same pressure axis. This synthetic file has been designed to facilitate the use of BGC data. The goal of a simplified synthetic profile is to collocate as many BGC observations as possible while preserving the character of the sampling pattern. For example, sample, sample interval, number of samples, and approximate pressure location. So, as an advice, use these synthetic files for your application. They are much easier to, to manipulate and to use. A set of data access and services has been set up on the GDAC, the basic FTP server. Uh, GDAC snapshots that are with a, with a DOI that are easy to, to refer to in your publication. A synchronization system that allows you to, to have a copy of the GDAC on your own computer more easily. A thread and an RDAP server that allows you to do setup, to do subsetting uh, using these services. And interactive data selection that, uh, that I will describe in the next slide. And you also, we have also recently set up a Python library that, uh, that is developed as a collaborative tool. The data selection, it allows you to, ha to have, uh, to do some selection based on special, temporal, by parameter, by QC, by DAC, and so on, by a year of deployment, or only the good data, for example. It, uh, it provides export on the CMEMS, Oceanside NetCDF file, in ASCII files, and also on the Argo, Argo NetCDF format. It allows also data visualization. All the general information Argo are available on the Argo website, and all the manual are available on the Argo data management website available. Thank you, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact uh, the service desk that we have at Coins. Thank you very much for that. Um, and we already have a few questions in the Q&A, which we'll get to in a minute. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand um, or put it into the Q&A and we'll, we will um, ha uh, have a look at them a bit closer. So the first um, I want to quickly address, um, it's come up a, a few times now, so this uh, presentation is being recorded, um, and once the recording is finished, we will load onto the GOOT uh, webinar website, um, where you'll be able to watch it again um, and, and have a look at it in your own time. I will share that link again um, in the uh, chat box, um, and we can share it again afterwards. You're welcome to get a hold of us. Um, so if you go onto, if you search for GOOT webinars, you will find it. I'm going to hand over now to Catherine, who would like to answer the question around the BGC data um, in terms of, of uh, whether that's been uh, shown as well. Uh, Catherine, would you like to go ahead? Uh, to the question that uh, will uh, the, the, the webinar will cover as well BGC Argo data management? Yes. So I already answer online. And uh, yes, uh, BGC Argo and Core Argo are using the same uh, data management system. Which means um, that all data, uh, regardless of which parameters are collected by those algorithms, will come through um, the same data management system. So everything that we've shown, uh, you'll be able to access all different types. Um, 
So barring any other questions that have yet to come up in the chat or by raising hands, um, we have uh, one of the, the issues we would like, or one of the things we'd like to um, show you further is that of easy to use data visualizations that we have, um, that the Argo team has got on their um, website. And I'd like to hand over to Megan to show that um, a bit more uh, for this webinar series. Thank you. Uh, great. Let me get this started. Okay, so you should be seeing hopefully the Argo uh, website here. And I was just going to show um, a couple of the pages that we've developed um, in case you want to find some of the links uh, that that we showed already in the presentation. So this first page that I'm um, showing you is the what I call the software tools page, and this is found under data and you can see at the very bottom <laughs> there software tools. So that's how how I got there. Uh, and uh, at the top here is ones that are more appropriate for people who are beginners. So uh, there's this really cool new um, website that's called the Argo Online School, and uh, it includes um, information about how to access and use Argo data. And um, they do that with online or downloadable Jupyter notebooks. So it's really cool. It's an interactive website. There's also videos um, talking about um, how to access things and kind of help you get started. Um, it's it's a really nice uh, introduction if you're trying to figure out how to get started accessing Argo data um, from the GDAX on your own. It's uh, built on using the Argo Pi uh, library that was mentioned in the video, but here's a link directly to that. Um, there's also this uh, web app called ArgoViz, and um, that's both the has both a front end um, that that's a web interface uh, that helps you visualize data, as well as um, what I, what we call the back end or the database that you can access via API calls, um, and that uh, has example calls in both MATLAB and Python. If R is your float uh, or your programming language, there's this package uh, that's been developed for in R called Argo Floats, um, which is also really helpful for getting started. And then finally, there's what we call the BGC Float Toolboxes, which is which are available over here, and um, they have a video um, along with packages in both Ma in MATLAB, Python, and R that focus um, on BGC Float data. But I recently learned that they've also been extended to include all um, data, not just BGC float um, data. There's further tools down here. Um, these are quality control tools. So these are, um, you know, more for experts that actually perform the quality control on the Argo data, uh, but they're just uh, publicly available in case you wanted to check them out. Uh, I also have under here, the visualizations page. And there's a lot of, uh, well, there's some overlap. Um, again, this talks about ArgoViz. These, these tools um, are kind of aimed more at actually looking at profile floats um, on your computer. Um, uh, sorry, profile data on your computer. Um, so uh, Sylvie mentioned the Euro Argo selection tool, um, the ArgoViz tool. The OceanOps dashboard is really great um, for learning about meta metadata, um, about the floats or technical information. Um, it's really kind of set up about around float deployments. So it's really easy to, to gain information about that. Um, the Marine Atlas is a bit outdated, but it's still available to download. Um, mon Océan et moi is set up to um, visualize BGC Argo data. The Euro Argo dashboard is a little bit more technical. Um, it, it kind of interacts well, it works well with the selection tool, but it's more of a monitoring of meta and technical data. The earth.nullschool.net is a really cool uh, layer that just kind of shows a rotating globe and you can see um, Argo temperatures and salinities and locations. 
The Argo Google Earth layer is also a bit outdated, but it's still available for download. Um, there's a Tableau that gives a lot of also meta and tech information about the distribution of data overall. And then Ocean Navigator is a tool that's coming online. Um, it's still kind of getting uh, tuned up, but the idea behind this one is it compares Argo data with um, model results and model outputs. So it's kind of cool um, to, to see how Argo is contributing to, to models. So I think that's kind of all I wanted to say about that unless there's other questions. I'm not looking at the chat. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, so Avelino has uh, uh, loaded up a question in the Q&A. Um, there's a huge lack of Argo in the Mozambique channel, and I would agree the Southwest Indian Ocean um, in general, despite its relative importance for climate regulation and also because the channel is considered a natural laboratory for studying music scale vortices. Um, I would like to suggest at some point we discuss some mechanism to overcome this problem. So yes, Avelino, maybe this is not quite the topic of today, but you, you raise a very valid point. There are a lot of, um, well not a lot, but there are a few uh, places in the ocean where we have got a, a lack of data and that um, impacts the global view of understanding the ocean. Um, and so in this regard, we need to have a look at a bit more detail and try to get close into those areas. And so that's definitely something we'd like to talk more to the regions about. Um, so let's stay in touch around that. Uh, Terry, I see you've shared your screen. Would you like to show us a bit more of, um, of that particular point? Yes, I'm here on the Argo Data Selection Tool. And uh, you may have the feeling that there is a lot of observation uh, from Argo floats uh, in the Bazandic Channel, but actually these are uh, observations that were performed over a very long period of time. So uh, it's uh, it's a bit misleading, but still there are some Argo observation in this area. Thank you, Terry. So yes, to look at historical data, I mean, it's, it's a very useful platform to, to do that. Um, and it's something that uh, potentially could be taken forward, at least understanding historically what's been going on in the Mozambique Channel, but it's something we definitely need, need to pursue certain areas and the Southwest Indian Ocean is one of those where we have a gap. We have a question from Digna. Is there a gridded product, e.g. monthly, of the different Argo parameters and if so, where to find it? Uh, I wonder who would like to take that question. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to if, if you'd like. Uh, yes, I can. I can show you again. There's a quite a large collection of of data, what I call products. So this is under data, and all the way at the bottom there, almost just data products. Uh, there's a few different categories. Right now, we landed on the one that is gridded fields of temperature, salinity, things like that. Uh, this started as a core Argo um, collection, and my understanding is that uh, BGC Argo is is looking into uh, making such products for different variables. I think that an oxygen one is just coming online. Um, and so when that happens, those will be added. Um, but here you can see there's a there's quite a large table um, with many different gridded products. And uh, there's a little description here on how to get them, um, what they're called and their, and their resolution. Um, in addition, there's velocity products. There's also, um, collections of profiles that are all interpolated to the same pressure levels. Um, and then there's also kind of curated collections of profiles that um, have been put through additional quality control measures. So just to be clear, these products are produced um, outside of Argo. Um, I am just, you know, making them available on the web page. So um, please, please use them, you know, carefully. Thank you, Megan. Um, Catherine is typing in an additional uh, answer to your question, uh, Digna. Uh, Lillian is, has asked a question, um, which of these visualization tools, in Megan's opinion, is the most appropriate to explore, visualize, and perhaps download typical TS profiles of an area of the ocean? So what would you recommend, Megan? <laughs> uh, well, I will say first of all that uh, back on the on the um, 
data visualizations page, there is a little article, which I forgot to mention right here that says compare visualization features. Uh, and then when you click on there, uh, it lists kind of the different um, features of them. But I do think that probably one of the easiest places to start is the Euro Argo data selection tool. Um, it does uh, let you look at things quickly and it does download your data quickly. Um, I think I'm hoping, you know, since I'm I'm involved in ArgoViz, that that will be um, coming spinning up soon uh, to the same ease as the Euro Argo data selection tool. But I think for right now that that's probably the best option. Um, and just for Lillian, uh, that was the tool that Thierry was showing uh, with the Mozambique channel um, float uh, profile or, or where they've been historical data. Um, so I wonder if somebody could just share that link into the uh, Q&A for us, that would be lovely. Um, another question that always comes through from a lot of um, users of Argo data is how do you reference Argo data? Um, uh, what is the best method of doing this? And I wonder if, um, Annie, if you would like to assist in terms of referencing both the, the Argo data set, but also uh, pointing in the direction of data papers um, for Argo. Uh, yes, of course. Um, several people in Argo many years ago came put a lot of efforts into uh, creating a DOI for the entire Argo data set. That was a challenge because at the time um, it wasn't popular. Argo data is a dynamic data set, meaning the data change all the time. You know, there are new data coming in and the adjusted data being revised constantly. So to come up with a DOI for a dynamic data set at that era was a challenge, but um, people got it done. So now we have a DOI system where there is a umbrella DOI that refers to the entire Argo data set, but there is also an extension that you could quote if you want to specify which month of the, on which year that you download the data from. What I mean is in addition to this DOI, the GDAC um, with the work with Thierry here, wraps the entire data set up once a month, creates a table, and that table gets a monthly extent, DOI extension. So you have two ways to cite Argo data. You can quote the umbrella DOI, or you can quote the umbrella DOI plus the extension that specifies the month from which you download the data from. Uh, in addition to that, a lot of a lot of papers now um, require you to quote um, a reference in addition to a DOI number. And the references, as Thierry is showing on the screen here, um, if Thierry can type the link of that page into the chat box, so box, so you can all see it. Uh, that link and that page will tell you exactly how to cite it um, and how to reference it. Maybe Thierry can type the link directly into the chat so people can access it. Thank you so much, Annie. I think we had a hand up earlier. I'm just trying to see if we did or didn't. Um, otherwise, uh, another question we've always had um, is to understand. Oh, okay. So uh, there's a question in the q and I am sure a number of students would be interested in a quick on-screen show and tell of downloading and visualize, visualizing, say, TNS profiles. I'm not sure if that's possible right now. Um, indication from the panel if that would be easy enough to do, or if it's something we can organize afterwards. Uh, from the Euro Argo, um, perhaps Thierry, would you be able to take us through the fleet monitoring uh, system of uh, how you would perhaps look at one or, or a section of the Argo data and download through the fleet monitoring tool and where it would come through onto your email? 
So do, do you want to have a short demonstration of the uh, yes, monitoring please. or do you just want the link? That would be great. Okay. No, no, a short demonstration if you can. Yes, my pleasure. So I share my screen. Uh, there are many things on my screen. Okay, no, I, that's fine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry because what I have on the screen is not what you're looking at. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Merci beaucoup. Um, so um, here, uh, no, that's not what I wanted to show. Um, so on. Yes, a quick demonstration of the field monitoring tool. So here, uh, on, I will send the URL, URL later, or someone can do it. Uh, you have a, a quick overview of all the floats that are active or that have been active uh, in the ocean. So by default, uh, we show uh, here the map and the list of the floats that are active. And if you want, so these are 3,700 flows in the ocean that are sending data. Uh, and the total number of uh, flows, I take active and inactive, uh, we are going toward 18,000 flows uh, in the ocean. Uh, here you have uh, indirect uh, the, the list of all these flows. And on this tool, you can select different criteria. For instance, uh, I want to see uh, data from uh, a particular country, let's, uh, let's say uh, Argentinian uh, floats. Uh, so here is a list of, uh, of these floats. Uh, so there are 16, uh, 60, uh, 16 floats, for it, uh, sorry, uh, that were deployed uh, for uh, Argentina. Uh, then if you want to have a look at the particular float, you have the detail and here on the map you have the trajectory of this float. So I'm going to look at it uh, closer. So it's a, it's a float that make a, a very nice trip from, uh, uh, from uh, Southern uh, America to uh, South Africa, a very nice trip. And here you have the metadata of the float. So uh, uh, what type of float, when was it deployed, uh, on, from what ship, and some information about its and so on. And here, uh, down there, you will have a series of, um, uh, of plots. Uh, so you see that it's a plot that performs 255 uh, cycles uh, of observation. Here you have the list, you have, you have the graphics uh, of uh, uh, all the temperatures that were measured by uh, this plot. The same for the salinity. Uh, this is not a BGC float. If it were a BGC float, you would, you would see the other parameters. Uh, let's have a look at the cycle 100 of this float. So you can have a look at the particular observation from uh, the float here. Uh, and let's have a look at here. So this is uh, the temperature. Uh, let's have a look at all the temperatures that were measured by uh, this float. So it's coming, it should uh, display, uh, be displayed rapidly. Um, and uh, I think that's uh, all for an overview of uh, the dashboard uh, for uh, the flow, uh, Argo Floats uh, dashboard. So in, in a few clicks, you can have a look at all uh, the, the floats uh, that have been deployed in, uh, in, uh, in the ocean and uh, have uh, information about uh, that float. And, uh, and I could say more, we have technical information, we have graphics about uh, the monitoring, also the behavior of the float. Uh, when mm -hmm. you have, uh, let's have a look at the active float, but that will be short. Uh, you have here a green light and a red line. And whenever you have a red line, that means that we determine that there is uh, an issue with that float on that day 
and uh, well, I will not enter and look at what it is, but uh, it's a very easy way to, to find if everything is going right or if there are some uh, some some issues or some things that uh, the float uh, operator should pay attention to. Thierry, could you also show um, maybe an example in the data selection tool of people yes. like drawing a box of and maybe adjusting the time or choosing the parameter and, yes. and how you download that? Yes. So uh, I did show you here the Argo floats dashboard. So it's, it's mainly to have information about the floats and what we call the metadata of the floats, which is the position and so on. Uh, and some graphics, uh, but here there is another tool that is the Argo data selection tool. So let's go and have a look at it. So here it's focused on data. And uh, by default, you look at the data of the Argo data from the last 10 days. So uh, we had a question about Mozamb Mozambique uh, Strait. So let's have a look at, uh, let's uh, focus on uh, Mozambique Strait here. So here we have, for instance, a float. I can have a look uh, at the, oh, it's a trajectory that I wanted to see. No. Yes, so I wanted to have a look at the trajectory of this float here. So you see that it's a float that was deployed in the Indian Ocean and that entered the Mozambique Strait. Uh, and uh, here you can uh, select data from the last 10 days or the last 30 days or all the data that are available uh, in a particular area. Uh, here we cannot show uh, the, the result they are. Right. Yes, so uh, if you look for all our data, you will have 2,600,000 uh, cycles uh, that you can download. Uh, if I go so in this particular area, uh, it will be uh, much less uh, data. Okay, so these are all the profiles, uh, data that are available. Um, and uh, you can make uh, polygonal selection. So I say, for instance, I want the data from here, from this particular square, I think. And uh, yes, so here I'm selecting data from this area only. And uh, this represents 200. Uh, uh, 40,000 something uh, cycles. Um, you can then decide to, yes, this is the data I want. So you click on export, and then you have a choice to have it in a comma separated format, in Argo original format, and another brand of NetCDF4 format, so Copernicus one. And when you, when you are happy with the selection, uh, then uh, you simply provide your email, uh, enter the CAPTCHA, and then download the data. And the data uh, will be, uh, it's a subsetting request. It will be processed within a few minutes or a few hours, uh, depending on uh, the size of the data you're looking for. Thank you very much, uh, Thierry. I think this also answers um, Ashraf's question. He was saying he was trying to download a long time period um, from say 2013 to present. Um, would this be a way of being able to do that in one uh, grouping of data as opposed by downloading year by year? Could you download all the data in that box from 2013 up until now? Um, yes, that, uh, that's a, that is a subsetting tool and it's exactly designed for this kind of, uh, of questions. I think the other thing to remember, Ashraf, is that it will obviously be a very large file that you're downloading. 
So sometimes to ease up your own uh, data download possibilities um, going year by year might make it a bit easier depending. Um, a question uh, from Pavati, which I wonder um, if uh, somebody could answer, is is it a good idea to deploy Argo floats in shallow basins like the Persian Gulf? Uh, perhaps Megan, if you'd like to take that one. Hello. Uh, so in, in the past, when Argo started, it was really hard to deploy floats um, in shallower regions, often because the floats ended up grounding um, due to long periods of time um, kind of drifting along the surface. Uh, with newer float models uh, and newer communication systems, it's much easier to keep um, floats from grounding. So uh, we are kind of slowly getting them into um, shallower regions. Um, that being said, sometimes they're still not the perfect way to sample that those regions and, you know, maybe something else like um, gliders might be more appropriate. I know that there are some um, kind of coastal floats uh, that are that are developed um, and they're being used in, in some areas to um, look at things more carefully, um, but it hasn't, it hasn't, there are not a ton of Argo floats in shallower regions yet. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Christina's got a question. Um, is there a way to visualize velocities? And if so, how close to the surface are they? Um, I wonder, Annie, if you'd be able to help us with that. Uh, I'll try, but other people on the panel will probably be able to answer better, but um, there are velocity products. Um, I don't know how easy to visualize velocities based on those products. Velocities are usually computed at about a thousand meters. Uh, there are also surface velocities, but those will be the two depths you, um, that the velocity data come in. Uh, other people like Thierry and Megan will know more about the visualization part. So I'll let them answer that part. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the closest thing I can think of um, is a pro like a product, a feature of of Argoviz, so I can I can show you that. It's not quite um, what what you're talking about, um, but this is this is the Argoviz um, web interface, and you can go to choose viewer and go to float trajectory forecast. And uh, here, this is this is a um, interface that's based on a um, matrix, basically a prediction of where floats will go. Um, over time. So here's my little float. And if you want to see what will happen to a float in the next, say, 60 days, you can click and see how likely it is for the float to move to a different region over time. Um, so it's kind of fun to play around with and see um, where floats are supposed to go um, based on previous trajectories that floats have taken. Um, I know Maybe Thierry will know more, but um, I know that someone in France, Guillaume Mace, <laughs> made a really cool um, prediction tool also for use in classrooms. Um, it was only in French the last I heard of it, but um, I'm not sure if, if he has more information about that one. Um, yes, I, I, I do not have the link, I'm sorry, uh, but it's uh, called uh, West TT, and this is uh, uh, a serious game uh, dedicated to uh, uh, schools. Uh, where you uh, adopt a float and then you try to guess uh, where the float will emerge uh, next time uh, for its next cycle and uh, you got a score and you can play with your, your schoolmates uh, with uh, this game and uh, that shows also the deep water circulation but I'm sorry I do not have the link uh, now. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got two BTC uh, Argo flow questions. The first is around the Mediterranean Sea, um, where there were quite a few active BTC Argo floats. Now, since there are no more active BTC sensors except for oxygen, 
in general, are the sensors replaced? Um, or do you think there are going to be new BGT Argo deployments in the Mediterranean region? Probably be a question for Catherine and Thierry. Yes, but you know that uh, the, the flood deployments are linked to this project. So I know that in the past, uh, there was a lot of projects in the Mediterranean Sea and the, 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 the floats are dying right now. But uh, I am aware of an Italian uh, project that will uh, soon start. And uh, I think he, he will uh, deploy his floats uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. But uh, the, uh, I, this question is, is, a, is not uh, a data manager question, I will say. It's like more or less a political question or funding. So, so I know that there will be uh, in the future some floats in the Mediterranean Sea, but I don't know how many. Thank you, Catherine. Um, how successful are BGC um, floats in the marginal ice zone or the Antarctic region? Um, it's a, quite an interesting question, maybe um, linked more to the SOCOM project. Yes, but I, I can answer. I think the SOCOM project was a success. So I would say uh, the BGC probe works well, work well during the SOCOM project. and. Um, we also have some uh, French project near the Kerguelen Island, and we also have good results there. So uh, we have still some work to perform delayed mode there, and we have still work to to work on to on the trajectories of the float when they when they are under ice. But I think the BGC probes works well work well in the in this area. Thank you. Um, Annie, is there anything you'd like to add to that answer? Yeah, so the project that Catherine mentioned, which has the acronym SOCOM, is a US NSF funded project called the Southern Ocean Carbon and Climate Observation and Modeling, which has the acronym SOCCOM, which we lovingly call SOCOM. It is coming up to about its eighth year. It uh, focuses on deploying BGC floats in the Southern Ocean, south of 60 South in the seasonal ice zone and has produced many, many good BGC and TS profiles. Um, the sensors, work well in that area. I mean, the cold water is not a problem for the sensors. It's more that the, um, the flow being in the ice, you know, runs a risk of being run over by ice flows. And so, so those flows are equipped with a special ice avoidance algorithm to mitigate that risk. Other than that, they work just as well in cold water as they do in warm water. And I will um, put the link of the SOCOM project in the chat box for people who are interested to browse that web page to learn more about it. Thank you so much, Annie. I think we have time for one last question, um, which is, I'm gonna address this to Megan as a start. Is it best to use the original or the adjusted variable in the uh, data set in the data of your data set? Uh, we always want you to use the adjusted variable if it's available. That's the you know variable that a lot of time and, and um, an expert has really looked at the data to develop the best possible estimate of that variable. And that will be in the adjusted variable. Those are the ones that are you know okay to use for climate type studies. We really do not suggest using the original or the raw data in studies where it's really important to have high accuracy. If it's not so important and there's no adjusted data available, you know, go for using the 
the original data, especially for the core variables, as, as Sylvie mentioned. Um, the BGC variables need a little bit more adjustment, yet they are adjusted more rapidly than the core variables. So you, you know, can find adjusted, um, you can expect to find adjusted variables in a shorter amount of time than you might for a core um, variable. And usually those um, adjustments, the delayed mode adjustments for core are available about a year or year and a half after um, the profile was taken. Um, Annie may want to add any anything I missed on there. Uh, no, Megan, I think you described it uh, very well. We keep the raw data in the data file together with the adjusted data for as a best practice in data management because you always want to keep the raw data because the adjustment is applied to the raw data and we're continuously revising the adjustment. So, um, you know, we do that as a matter of good practice in data management. But um, the raw data, you know, is use it at your own risk. It has instruments of problems, instruments, calibration drifts. And so you really need to be careful if you resort to using the raw data. Thank you very much. So Catherine's typing a, an answer in for the very last question that came through on the algorithm uh, for the trajectory and correction under I, sorry, uh, a trip over words from time to time. Um, so at this stage, um, we're probably at the end of our hour. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think it's been very useful. If you have, um, we provided the survey link now. Um, please look out for the email with the survey link um, and we'll send it out uh, to the registered um, attendees uh, shortly. Um, if you have any more queries, don't hesitate to get in touch with the Argo team uh, through the website. Um, and we look forward to hearing more from you, um, as well as those members on the call who are keen to get involved with deploying close to under, under studied areas, such as the Mozambique Channel. Uh, please stay in touch. Um, we'll look at, uh, we, we're trying to build it uh, to be a truly global ocean observing system. Um, and so we're looking forward to engaging more with you in the future. Uh, so from all of us, thank you very much and um, have a lovely day further evening, morning. Thank you.